cannot erase now I walk within your favor grace unending and my salvation I will boast in Christ alone his righteousness and not my own and I will cling to Christ my hope, His mercy reigns now and forever. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood.
clothes that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hey Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. I want to welcome you to Lighthouse Baptist Church and uh, glad to have you here for Palm Sunday, uh, part of our uh, The Wonder of Your Cross. And uh, we're having the uh, Easter cantata here at the early service at 845. They did a fantastic job and uh, it was very, very powerful. So I hope that you've come with a hearts that are prayed up and ready to, to receive uh, what God would have for us here today. If you're here today visiting, just hold up your hand. Uh, we won't call on you to say anything or anything like that, but we have a gift for you we'd like to give you. So just hold up your hand. I see some folks here uh, over here as well. Um, anyone else on this side visiting with us? We got a gift there for you, coffee mug. Inside of that coffee mug, uh, there's a visitor card. If you'd be so kind as to fill that out, just drop it in the offering basket as it comes by here a little bit later on. Well, before we go to the Lord in prayer, just a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, we're going to go right into our cantata here. After the cantata is over, then we'll have a, a sermon uh, to follow. We would encourage you today that if you're here to help us with uh, any distractions, make sure your cell phones are turned off. If you have any uh, coughing episodes, more than an occasional cough, off, all right, uh, or if your kids are getting a little rambunctious or you can't sit through it or something, we have what's uh, called a cry room out here, and that's for people not just crying when the preaching's bad, but uh, they go out there and it's a room set up with live stream. We do also have a children's church set up for uh, kids up through fifth grade and then nursery, of course, for the youngest kids with a, a well-prepared um, staff, and so I just want to make you aware of those various things, but we're looking forward to a great uh, continuation. The first service was powerful. I was trying to hold back the, uh, the heartstrings a little bit because I had to preach, and so my heart was uh, being torn just listening to the, the songs, uh, seeing the reenactment of uh, what Christ has done for us. And so let's ask God's blessing on this service, and then after that you may be seated, and we will uh, introduce the, uh, the, the uh, special here today. And see if I can't call today, uh, Jody Pars, would you pray for us? Amen. You may be seated. This time the LBC choir and drama team will present The Wonder of Your Cross. The Wonder of Your Cross. Hallelujah. Can you believe it? Jesus is alive. He's risen. I know I couldn't, especially after everything we've been through the last week, you know. Well, maybe you don't know. Well, I know you can't say hallelujah with your whole heart unless you know the whole story. Just imagine what it was like to watch him teaching in the temple, to walk alongside him, to see him speak to watch him perform miracles, to see the face of a girl no longer tormented, or the wonder and excitement of a deaf man hearing for the first time. That is why his entry into Jerusalem was so joyous. However, he was also met with great controversy from religious and political leaders. Even those who knew him personally would say, how can he call himself the Messiah? But that day, as he walked through the cheering, palm-waving crowd, surely you could hear it be said, this is the Messiah we have been waiting for.
Waving palm branches, I pass through the crowd. I join with the others, joyfully singing out loud. In the name of the Lord.
After the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, we were also exhilarated. Hope was in the air. Jesus asked us to go to the garden called Gethsemane. There, he asked us to watch and pray. But we were surprised by a group of Roman soldiers there to arrest Jesus, who had been betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was taken to Pilate, who had him beaten, and a crown of thorns placed on his head as they mocked him, calling him King of the Jews. And the crowd yelled, Crucify him! Crucify him! If they only knew 
It was Jesus' love for them that took him to the cross.
as Jesus' mother. I can't imagine how alone he must have felt as the crowds cried, crucify him, crucify him. Or how he even survived the beatings of the Roman soldiers. I prayed he would call a host of angels to his rescue. But he didn't. It wasn't to be. I knew he was the only one who could carry that cross to save us from our sins. But I was torn between the death of my son and his love for mankind. When he was born, he was crying and he needed me. But everything's changed and it's me who needs him. I held him first. He holds me now. crucified my son I was there when they crucified my son oh how it makes my heart tremble I was there when they crucified my son I was there when they crucified my friend I was there when they crucified my friend Oh, how it made my heart tremble I was there when they crucified my friend I was there when they crucified my Lord I was there when they crucified my Lord Oh how he made my
never be a moment when I am not in awe of the mystery of your mercy. All I gain through all you lost, may I never lose the wonder. sacrifice my soul is overwhelmed to see that heaven paid the highest price through blood and nails to ransom me may I never lose the wonder of your cross may there never be All I gave through all you lost May I never lose the wonder of your cross May the grace that took my sin and shame The love that took my place that day Always take my breath away grace that took my sin and shame, the love that took my place that day, always take my breath away. May the grace that took my sin and shame, the love that took my place that day, always take my breath away. Secret, 
Joseph of Arimathea petitioned Pilate for Jesus' body, and Pilate agreed. Joseph, along with Nicodemus, took Jesus' body, wrapped him in grave clothes and spices, and laid him in the tomb that they sealed with a stone. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, it was not my desire to crucify this man Jesus. I found no fault in him. This was a religious matter. As it was the custom during the feast of the Passover, I gave them the choice. Jesus or the murderer, Barabbas. It was their choice. I have no blood on my hands. He picked me, a struggling fisherman from Galilee. No one rich or important, he entrusted me to be a part of his inner circle. In the garden, he asked us to watch and pray. But what did we do? We fell asleep. Everything he said was true, everything. Right down to the one thing I thought was impossible. I denied him, my Messiah, Adoniah. I denied him three times just like he said I would. The rock on which I will build my church, he said. As much as I would have died for Jesus, Jesus died for me. He took my place. He died for you and he died for me. As it was said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the love Jesus displayed on the cross and the death he died there isn't the end of the story. While the mourners were still mourning and his loved ones were still trying to adjust to life without him, while the skeptics were cheering and the naysayers were celebrating, something was happening. His loved ones must have remembered what he had said, that this was not the end. But who could believe in such a thing? But somewhere in the night, the Lamb of the Cross became the Lord of an empty tomb. What would his friends say? What would they believe? They would know. All that he said was true. Jesus was dead, but now is alive.
Amen. Powerful. Let's give him a hand as we're seated today. What a powerful cantata. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, I hope your heart was blessed as much as mine was in a very, very powerful uh, singing and, and cantata and, and, a, and reenactment of everything, and I uh, hope that your heart was just stirred there. And I'd like to just share a few thoughts today. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 14. When you find your place there, if you'd stand with me today to, to honor God's Word, we'd like to uh, give you a, a closing a challenge, a message here on the gospel and what it is, and we just will uh, encapsulate uh, what you've heard in song and what you've been able to see. So Galatians chapter 6, verse number 14. Today we'll talk about the, the, wonder of, of, the wonder of your cross, and so we're going to talk about his cross today. Galatians 6, verse 14, if you follow along with me there, I just want to focus in on that one verse, the wonder of his cross. Notice here in Galatians 6, 14, it says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Let's pray today. Dear Holy Father, we pray that you would just continue to stir in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would just help us, God, any decision that needs to be made, that we would make that decision. We would not just be hearers and observers, but we'd be doers of what we've heard and seen. We pray that you'd just touch hearts. If there be anybody today that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, may this be the day that they want know the wonder of the cross and what you've done for us. I pray that anyone here today that is in Christ, but maybe we haven't been boasting and glorying in you alone, Lord, help us to return to that foundation. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated today. I want to talk today about the wonder of his cross. Why glory in the cross? Why glory in the cross? Paul here talks about what he boasted in, what he gloried in. And when you think about that, we boast in a lot of things, don't we? Uh, we know what glory is. We know what boasting and bragging is. There's really uh, so much we boast in. The question may be uh, better asked is what don't we boast in, right? We boast in where we live. We boast in our achievements. We boast in our our skills, maybe where we live, what we do, our skill, our trade, what we find uh, we're a part of, a team we support, or a party that we're uh, supporting. There's so many things today that we boast in. Paul could have boasted in many things. You know, personally, he could have boasted. Philippians 3 talks about that. He could have boasted in his flesh. He could have boasted that he was a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, that he was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, of the stock of Israel, that he had kept the Mosaic law to the best of his ability, circumcised the eighth day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was zealous for the law. He could have boasted in his Roman citizenship. He could have boasted that he had the foremost education under the teacher Gamaliel. He could have boasted of many things, but he didn't boast of anything personally. He could have boasted of many things regarding Jesus Christ. He could have boasted of his virgin birth. He could have boasted of his ministry, his teaching and preaching. He could have boasted of the many miracles that the Lord did. But notice as it says in Galatians 6, verse 14, what Paul boasted in. He said, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. His boast was in one thing, and it was in the cross of Christ. And today I want to just challenge our thoughts with the wonder of his cross. Paul declares he glories in one thing, and that is the cross. Now, when we think about the cross, we know what it symbolizes, don't we? The cross is the symbol of Christianity, isn't it? And we know the world uh, is aware of that. Uh, when you see the cross, you can't help but take your mind and life to the person of Jesus Christ. The cross stands out. It has always been and always will be the symbol of Christianity. But what makes the cross stand out? What makes it the beacon of hope for so many? What makes the cross today so wonderful? You know, we may not understand it the way the first century uh, citizen would have understood it. To them, the cross was a humiliating form. It was a form of capital punishment. Th to say that you boast in the cross would have been the greatest paradox. This makes no sense. You're saying things out of both sides of your mouth. You understand that to them... They would not speak of the cross in public in uh, a, a conversation. It was such a, a torturous, a horrific form of capital punishment. You see, what makes this significant is this. Nowhere in our world today do you go around and find electric chairs mounted on the tops of buildings. No religions gather themselves around the lethal injection needle. No one gathers today around swords or guillotines. No, we don't dangle those from our neck. 
But yet you see the symbol of the cross was really just another form of capital punishment. So what is it that makes the cross so significant? What is it about the crucifixion invented by the Persians, continued by the Romans, before finally Constantine outlawed it out of reverence for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? There was no more excruciating way to die, and that word excruciating has at its core the, 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 cru- the cruce or the, cro- the cross there. It was excruciating way to die. You would not speak of it in polite public conversation, and they would often replace that word cross with someone who was unlucky hung on a tree because they didn't want to speak of how gruesome it was. Yet when Paul began to glory and boast and brag, he boasted in one thing. It was in the cross, the cross of Christ. You know, this is what Isaac Watts was stirred by when he was called as the father of English hymnody, writing over 700 hymns. And his foremost, arguably, was none other than the song entitled, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. The prolific Charles Wesley said of the more than 6,000 hymns he wrote, he would give them all up if he could have just written this one. Listen to the words of this. He was inspired by Galatians 6.14 when he writes these words. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from His head, His hands, His feet, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. When you survey the wondrous cross today, and as you gaze upon the symbol of the cross behind me, and you think of what it meant, and you think of the glory that was there, that Paul boasts of, Let me share a few reasons today why we glory in the cross. God created us for His glory to know and love Him. Mankind went their own way. And sin is really just that. It's man going their way and not God's way. They disobey. We disobeyed God. And as a result, God had to make a way of salvation. He planned it from eternity past. Number one, the first reason I give you today why we glory in the cross and the wonder of it is number one, His cross was required His cross was required. Why was the cross necessary? Because of our sin. We sinned. You sinned. I sinned. We've all sinned. The Bible makes clear that there are none righteous, no, not one. There are none of us that are right with God. There are none of us that are acceptable and approved and stand as God is. None of us are standing in a good position toward the Lord. The Bible says that none of us are good. None of us are righteous. Many will say, well, no one's perfect, but God. And then God says to us through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as my Father in heaven is perfect. You see, some of us think we're going to be okay on Judgment Day because we look around us and we compare ourselves among ourselves. The Bible declares that's not wise. God doesn't compare you to each other. He compares you to Himself and to His perfect Son, Jesus Christ. And compared to Him, we all fall short. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word sin is the Greek word hamartia. It means to miss the mark. It means to aim for perfection, to aim for the bullseye, and to shoot that uh, arrow and to come up short the distance from where you strike the ground or below the target to the perfect, perfect bullseye. That distance is sin. And the Bible says, in order to be right with God, you have to be perfect every day of your life, every deed of your life, every attitude of your heart. And it even tells you that when the day you were born, you were already in sin because of your forefather, Adam. So the Bible clearly says we have all fallen short of the glory of God. If you sin three times a day, 365 days a year, and live just 70 years, that's 70,000 crimes. There isn't a judge on the planet that are going to let you walk. And you can be assured if there's no judge or no authority down here that's going to let us walk, that the perfect holy God of heaven will let no one get by. And so you must understand the cross was required. Our sin required a sacrifice. All throughout the Old Testament, we see that sin required atonement. Sin required a payment. 
That's why the blood is all throughout the Bible. The Bible is a bloody book. Why? Because we are sinful people. And the only way God can be having our sin atoned for is through the shedding of blood. We see it in Adam and Eve's sin. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. God says, I won't have it. And he slew animals and covered them with the coats of skin. And the shedding of that blood atoned, if you will, for their sin. We see it in the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12. When God saw the blood on the doorpost and the door lintel, then he would say, I would pass over those who had the blood applied to their life and home. We see it in the sacrificial lamb on the day of atonement where an animal was sacrificed and the shedding of blood covered the sins of the priests and of the people. We see it in Isaiah 53, verse number 4, when it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for his, no, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 10 goes on to say, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him the grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Hebrews 9 22 ties it all together with these very clear words. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins outside of the blood that is shed, and Jesus Christ and his cross was required. Secondly, the cross refutes. Not only does it require, but secondly, it refutes. It refutes all human effort. You see, you come today and you begin to understand that God is holy and we are not. God is good and we are bad. God is perfect and we are evil. And you know that. You, you recognize that. You know you haven't kept God's law. You know the guilt of your heart. You know what you know, and you know what other people don't know about you. God knows all of it. And you understand this. And then you begin to say, well, what do I need to do, Pastor? How can I work this off? How can I clean my life up? What must I do to be right with God? And you, like Adam and Eve, come to God like I do, and we try to cover ourselves, don't we? We cover ourselves with a religion of fig leaves. And God says, I will not accept the works of your hands. I will only accept the sacrifice of an animal on your behalf. I will accept the sacrifice on your behalf. The cross refutes all human effort. If I were to ask you today, do you know for sure if you die today, you would go to heaven? You may be here today and say, yes, I would, or I believe so, or I hope so. But if I pressed you a little bit more and said, let's just imagine you stood before God, and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? And you begin to tell why. And what you would say in that moment really declares what you're trusting in. And if you begin to say, well, I have, and you fill in the blanks, I have been a good person. I have been baptized. I'm a member of a church. I've done a lot of good deeds. I'm not as bad as most. And you begin to give all this litany of works, litany of fig leaves, and God says, I will not have any of it. You see, Paul didn't boast of any of the works of his hands. He boasted in one thing, the thing he could not do by himself. And he boasted in the cross of Jesus Christ. And he looked to the cross. You see, the cross refutes all human effort. The Bible makes clear in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, Paul says, all my works, he says, I count as loss for Christ. All the things that were gained. He says, they're all but dung. They're all as refuge. They mean nothing. Because human effort cannot atone for our sin. It cannot appease a holy God. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21 also says, I'm crucified, yet I live. Verse number 21 goes on to say further, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you could be saved any other way, Jesus would not have died. And Jesus died on the cross, and the cross refutes any human effort. So whatever you bring in your hands today, you need to drop it all and cling only to the cross of Jesus Christ. The third thing then is this. Not only does it pour contempt on all our pride, but at number three, the cross reflects. Not only does the cross require, was it required, but number two, the cross refutes human effort. Number three, the cross reflects the depravity of mankind. You see, the cross shows us, I trust that your heart was stirred. And if it's not, you probably become calloused. If you could see just the, the symbol there, the, the picture of Christ as he, as he was there upon the cross, or you could hear the beating of the nails, or you could see the, the, the torture and the pain and the shame that he bore. You see, the cross reflects the depravity of mankind. It shows us just how wicked the human heart is. It shows us just how far mankind would descend in sin. 
Acts 2.23 tells us that mankind by their wicked hands have crucified and slain him. Acts 2.36 says as well, we have crucified the Lord and Christ. Dr. Ironside said this, the cross of Christ is the measure of man's hatred to God. We took all of our whole, uh, unholy wrath out on Christ and crucified Him. Donald Gray Barnhouse shows us just how vile man is. He says, God will give a man brains to smelt iron and make a hammerhead and nails. God will grow a tree and give man strength to cut it down and brains to fashion a hammer handle from its wood. And when man has the hammer and the nails, God will put out his hand and let man drive nails through it and place him on a cross and the supreme demonstration that men are without excuse. You see, the cross reflects just how low mankind is going. But number four, the cross reveals, it reveals the character of God. That God says, I will go, I will send, I will love, I will give, I will be the seeker, I will be the Savior. He sought us when we were not seeking Him. He loved us when we were not loving Him. He came to us when we were not asking for a Savior. It is the intervention of God. God was estranging two enemies together. He was bringing the two parties together. It shows us His eternality his omniscience, his omnipotence. He knew the plan from eternity past. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. You see the love of God at the cross. I've heard it said, well, I always thought love looked like a heart. And yet in truth, it's nothing more than a bloody cross. The bloody cross is this greatest symbol of love you would ever know. The immutability of God is seen in the cross. We see that God did not change. You know, it would have been, in one sense, you could argue, why didn't God's justice stop when he had to suffer and cause his own son to die? You think he would come to that point and say, I I can't do this to my son. But God's perfection and uh, his unchangeable ways carried all the way through to where he would even crucify his own son and allow it to go through. You say, how in the world? This is the love of God. This is the unchangeableness of God, that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the fact that He doesn't change gives us promise that He won't lose our salvation in the future, but He'll save us unto the uttermost. Number five, the cross recognizes. It recognizes it's the work of God alone. You see, on that cross that day, there was only one person hanging there, and there was only one person that could hang there. Hebrews 1, verse number 3 says, When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, by himself he purged our sins. He didn't need the church to purge our sins. He didn't need the Pope to purge our sins. He didn't need the waters of baptism to purge our sins. He, by himself, on the cross, in our place, covered and paid for and purged our sins. He did it for us. Colossians 2, 14 says it was... His cross, the cross recognizes. Number six, the cross reconciles. It takes God and man and brings them together. At the cross, listen to what he did. John MacArthur says it well. Listen, God in the person of his incarnate son has intervened on behalf of sinful humanity to reverse our estrangement from him. When repentant sinners acknowledge their sin, affirm Jesus as Lord, and trust solely in His completed work on their behalf, God credits His righteousness to their account. Listen to what He says. Please get these words. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if He had lived our lives with all our sin, so that God then could treat believers as if we lived Christ's life of pure holiness. All of our sins... Our long list of crimes against God were legally charged to Him on the cross as if He had lived them so that Christ's righteous life could then be credited to us as if we lived that righteous life. This is the doctrine of justification by imputation. It is the high point of the gospel. That truth expressed so concisely in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He hath made Him. Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Colossians 1 also spells this out very clearly. It says this, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether it be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, through death, 
to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. You know the great doctrine of imputation is this, that God took all of our sin, mine, yours, the world, He, died, he took all that sin and He took it out on Jesus Christ. You talk about the greatest scapegoat, the greatest sacrificial lamb. He took it all. He bore it all. And God literally, it pleased the Father to crush His own Son. Why? Did His Son do anything? No. But He was treating His Son as if every sinner and every sin that had ever been committed was put on His Son. And He crushed His own Son. Why? So that He could then give you the life that you could never live. You could walk away a free man. You could walk away holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. So when you come, why should you boast of the cross? Because you and I come as sinful people. We come and we are not holy. We are not uh, unblameable or unreprovable. We come guilty. We all know and understand that. But Jesus Christ bore it all. He became our sin. He bore our sin so that He would take our death that we might have His life. What a glorious picture. Number seven, the cross rewards. It rewards all who believe. If you'll come today and turn from your sin and by faith believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that He was born a virgin, born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. He was buried. Three days later, He arose again. He's ascended into heaven. He's by Himself purged our sin. If you'll come and believe upon Him today, He will save you. You can be justified by faith. He will give you the righteousness you could never work for or earn. What does the Bible tell us will be the spiritual blessings? Well, Ephesians 1 says that we will have all spiritual blessings. He says there that we are chosen and adopted, accepted, redeemed, forgiven. We are abounding. We are gathered into the family of God. We gain a spiritual inheritance. We are saved and sealed under the praise of God evermore. He would recover all that was lost in the fall of man. He would reverse the curse of sin. He would bless us with salvation and adoption and justification and imputation and sanctification and one day glorification. And lastly, number eight, and I'm done, is the cross requires. It requires something of you. You must come and believe. You must turn from sin and you must call on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just enough to hear about it. It's not just enough to know it. It's not just enough to be able to repeat it. You have to come and by faith believe on what He did alone for you. And if you will, you will be saved. Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24, it requires you to do something. It requires you to give your life to Him. See, preacher, that's a big ask. It's not a big ask when you gaze deep into the cross and you survey the wondrous cross on where our Savior and Lord died, and you think about the fact that the God-man gave you His life, there's nothing too much He could ask for you to give to Him. The Bible says in Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So at the cross, as you survey the cross, He demands your soul, your life, your all. As you gaze upon the cross today, remember, at the cross, mankind was at His worst. But praise God, He was at His best. At the cross, the justice of God met the mercy of God. At the cross, sin was judged and salvation was gained. And there is something you must do and there is something you must avoid doing. You must repent and believe and receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the only way of salvation. And the second thing you must not do is you must not reject Jesus Christ. You neglecting Him is rejecting Him. You're either boasting in the cross or you're rejecting the cross. What will it be today? God's plan of salvation was seen through His Son. Listen to Romans 8.32. He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? When you think about the cross, it's a gruesome uh, scene. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible, tragic thought to consider. When you think about this, God could at any time call it off. The Father could have withheld the judgment. He could have, the Son could have, 
called the angels. The Father could have called it out, but neither did, and the Godhead Trinity carried it out, that God did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, tells us several things, that our sin had to be paid for. It tells us that God is a holy and just God. And these are truths our minds don't understand. These are beyond our ability to comprehend. But when you think about this, God did not restrain any wrath from Him. He did not withhold the suffering. He did not withhold the mocking and shame and spitting or plucking out of the beard, the humiliation, the crown, the torment, the agony, the nails in His hand, the feet, the piercing in His side. But please note something. If God would, the Father would look upon the Son and permit wicked hands to slay His own Son, and He, in a sense, by His predetermined forecounsel a knowledge of God, crushing His own Son. Listen, if God would not let His Son off the hook, don't think for a second you're going to walk away without facing judgment. And you have a very serious decision to make today. You're either going to come where God has already judged, or you're going to stand before God waiting to be judged. You're either going to come in the cross where His judgment is already burned, or you're going to stand before God and you're going to bear all your own sin. So today it's real simple. The youngest child today that could comprehend anything would understand this. You have sin before a holy God that you cannot clean up. You can't talk your way out of it. You can't cover it up. You can't blot it away. You can't work it off. And the only thing you're going to do is you're going to stand before God and He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Go to hell forever. Go to lake of fire forever. That's option one. And that's what you all will face. You will die. You will split hell wide open and you will suffer for all eternity. If that doesn't sound like a good proposition, let me give you the good news today. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life you could never live. He died a sacrificial life, a death that you could never die. He was buried in glory. Hallelujah. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about Sundays are coming. Amen. And he arose glorious, victoriously, and he has ascended into heaven. He will save all that will come unto him and believe. So it's real simple today. You're going to pay for your sins, or you're going to let Jesus and his cross pay for your sins. Which will it be today? Don't walk out of here saying, I'll put it off. I'm going to live my life first. No, He demands your life because He gave you His life. It's a real clear choice. And today I pray that you'd make the right choice. Would you stand with me today? As you stand and bow your heads and close your eyes, gaze deep into the cross, consider what He's done. There's both a promise and a threat. The promise is He will save all that believe. But there's also the threat that if you don't believe, you're under the judgment of God. If you don't accept the only gift He gave, there's not many ways, there's one way. If you refuse that gift, there is no other salvation. There stands no other payment for sin. And today, my friend, I want to invite you to come. How many of you would say, Pastor Ryan, I'm here. I know Christ as Savior and Lord. See my hand today. Thank you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and you say, I need to be saved, Pastor. I don't know if I died, if I'd be ready to stand before God. My soul's not ready. I, I haven't been saved. I don't have my sins forgiven. I've never believed and been born again through Jesus Christ. If that's you today, my friend, I'm not going to point you out or embarrass you. But would you be honest enough today just to raise your hand and say, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. I see that hand. Somebody else? Balcony, main floor, I see that hand. If you're here today and you raise your hand and others as well, I, I can't see everyone everywhere. There's a lot of folks here. I want to invite you to come. I want you to step out from your seat, walk forward. There are altar workers here on either side of me. There's men and women that would sit down and share with you, young or old alike. Listen, don't delay. God loves you. Christ died for you. There's no greater gift that could ever be given than the love that God gave you through His Son, Jesus Christ. And please don't turn away. Don't turn away from that salvation that is yours. It's there. He'll save you today. Would you come today? As others have come and others are coming, would you come? If you're young or old alike, don't delay. I, I don't know how I can make it any more clear. The, the songs, the cantata clearly demonstrated. And God did this for you. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, that's any of us, that will believe on Him will be saved. Today, if you'll come, He will save you. As the others have come and are praying and making decisions, I pray you would come today. You don't have to come alone. Bring the one next to you. They'll come with you. Dear Lord, we pray you bless this invitation time. Touch every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come as we sing as others have already come? and are praying and are making decisions. If you need to come, would you come? I just want to come and say, Lord, I want to boast of you. I want to determine that nothing's known but you and you alone being crucified, that you are the Savior, that all my boast is in you, Christ, you and what you've done for me. Would you come as we sing? Keep me near the cross as we sing. Would you come today? Would you come? Jesus.
Jesus, keep me near the cross. Bear a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream. Flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Just bow your heads where you're at as these uh, kneel and some are making decisions and praying and God's dealt in your heart today. I want to invite you to come. The most important decision you could ever make. You know, you may be thinking your life and the next decision and next week and what your future will hold. There's no, no greater decision you could ever make than to come and turn your life over to the Lord, the one who loved you, the one who created you. You'll find the purpose of God and the plan of God and freedom from sin and salvation and eternal life. And you'll have a new life and a new purpose to walk with Him and to serve Him and His purpose. There's nothing like it. God's dealt in your heart today. Would you come? As he's pray, we invite you to come. Let's we'll sing through another verse. You come as God deals in your heart. Would you come? Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow. Got a wonderful decision to share with you today. Josh Whitley has come today to receive Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. Glad for Josh's decision. Amen. Amen. I, I would encourage any of you, if you're here and you've got questions about your salvation or where you stand with the Lord, please hang around and talk to any of us. We'd be happy to sit down and try to answer any questions and help you in, in that journey. And so uh, you may be seated today. Make sure you let Josh know you're glad about that decision. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's the greatest decision a person can, can make today. Uh, thank the Lord for that. Well, if this time I can have the ushers come, and this is just a regular church offering. Uh, so if you're visiting, please, by all means, this is not for you. This is for our church folk. And so, uh, But if you are visiting, if you'd be so kind to take a moment, fill out the visitor card and just Drop it there in the basket that we might get a record of your visit. Just a few announcements and we'll uh, be done. Uh, we have our evening service tonight at 6 o'clock where we'll have the Wonder of Your Cross uh, Easter cantata there again. And then uh, Wednesday night as part of Holy Week, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper. And then this Friday as part of Good Friday, we'll be having the final uh, showing there of the Wonder of Your Cross cantata. And then next Sunday is Easter Sunday as we celebrate the risen Savior and Lord. We uh, have a little different service schedule, 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock, two mirroring services there. Uh, no Sunday school or evening service, so please take note of that. But come join with us as we celebrate next Sunday the resurrected risen Lord. Amen. He's alive because He lives we can face whatever, amen, and our salvation is secure. And all that he said, uh, God verified and vindicated by his resurrection. Well, let's ask God's blessing on the offering. And Greg Wells, would you pray for us?
been a great Palm Sunday, man. We're just getting started. This is going to be a great week as we just reflect upon what Christ did and what God's love uh, demonstrated and how that was shown. What, what a glorious God we have and a wonderful Savior. Amen. So as you go out today and you boast, make sure you boast in Christ. Amen. And what he's done for us. Let's close out with a word of prayer. Be back with us tonight at 6 o'clock. I invite someone and uh, tell them about the opportunities to, to come view. There's two more this, this tonight at 6 o'clock and then Friday night uh, also at 6.30. Let's ask God's blessing as we uh, close out. And uh, Shane Browning, would you pray for us?